Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome back to Strange Mind 6. I'm your host, Ruby. And today, we are going to get back into the Octonumi. But before we do that, I would like to ask if you haven't already subscribed, please do so now. And hit that like button. It definitely helps out. But grab your drinks, grab your snacks, or if you want, sit back and relax, and let's get into it, shall we? Hello, boys. With mirrors being a vital part of any respectable bewitcher's domain, it is no surprise that the boys find themselves confronted with their own images reflected an infinite number of times around the room. Trad, however, is less than impressed with the multiple reflections stretching ever outwards in the wall-to-wall, floor-to-ceiling, gilt frame, mirrors that greet them as the doors gently clicks to a close behind them. A collection of sparkling chandeliers spiral down from the considerably high ceiling, their subtle lighting glinting off the mirrors, being the only other items in the room. The smooth velvety words spoken as they enter the room, effortlessly cascade down and embrace them. Reg smiles at the warm tones and looks up as circling the room above them, a walkway slides into view upon which stands Lady Francine Josuta Isus, one of the three bewitchers responsible for overseeing the officially recognized activities of their colleagues within the UK. Age, unspecified, and best not mentioned, considered the most, how shall we say, inflexible of the three, and certainly the one most feared. Having acquired the use of Lady too long ago to mention, in by means too delicate to discuss, preferring instead to be addressed as Miss Francine, she is the only one of the three to have married a matter that only the ignorant or stupid referred to. Her hand rests lightly on the deep mahogany balustrade, black hair piled high with random falling ringlets framing her smoky eyes, the purple tinge quite obvious in the light, full painted aubergine lips with matching nails stark against her porcelain skin, the black body skimming dress, high necked and backless, shimmering to the floor and pooling at her feet. She positively radiates smoldering sophistication, beauty and grace. At least she does to Reg. Trad, whose initial fears had just been confirmed. Multiple images of him and Reg equaled multiple images of anything else that chose to appear. Is trying not to throw up. With a slight gesture of her hand, a section of floor and balustrade in front of 
phone seen disappears, appearing to be stepping out onto nothing, a staircase complete with handrail and finely carved spindles glides into existence with each step, creating the next stair tread in time with her movement as she descends tiny flecks of purple in her hair, dress, and shoes catch the light as she shimmers downwards. You are both looking fabulous as ever, she oozes, smiling directly at Trad. Especially you, darling. Have you freshened up just for us, she chuckles. Despite the draw of the honey-toned words, Trad has lowered his gaze, muttering his displeasure. Eloquent as ever, I see, Trad, she notes. He can feel her radiant smile shining down on him. Attempting to avoid eye contact, Trad turns his back to her, only to be confronted again by her many reflections around the mirrored room, bouncing her image from wall to wall, unable to avoid the her that he sees. He stares at his feet. How positively marvelous to see you both, she continues, hesitating slightly before placing her next step, suddenly stamping her foot. The stairs clearly taking too long to form. Damn it, she huffs, addressing the uncooperative step. Regaining her composure, she smiles and simply rises to her toes, rests her behind on the partial formed banister and makes to slide down the curving rail that materializes as she approaches and vanishes as she skims past, twirling her finger in the direction of Trad. He is spun around in time to catch her as she glides off the end, immediately recoiling in shock at his own actions, he instinctively ejects her from his arms. In one movement, a gentle rise of energy forms around her splayed hands, slowly bringing her to stand in front of them both. Still oblivious to my beauty then, Trad, she purrs. Your reputation goes before you, he says, brushing frantically at his clothes as if covered in something vile, all too aware of the delicious smell of Lang Lang. Such a charmer, she smiles and embraces Reg, who Trad notes is looking Decidedly starstruck. Hello, sweetie, she says to Reg, who merely grins more widely in reply. In an attempt to retain the contents of his stomach, Trad looks away and takes short swallow breaths. Well, let's go. The girls are waiting. Disengaging herself from Reg, she touches the edge of a mirror. Brace yourselves, this might be a little disorienting, she warns as gently pushing the side of the gilt frame, she sends the entire room into a slow spin. Gathering momentum, the mirrors slowly transform into a wall of doors before coming to a slow, smooth stop. And how do your customers react to all of this? Trad asks. This impossible room. Oh, sweetie. We all know people only see what they want to see. She looks accusingly back at him. I think... 
You are amazing, Mrs. Francine. Reg gushes, and the shop is amazing, and you have amazing stuff, and amazing, he trails off. Oh no, Mr. Regis, sir. Such a good boy, she smiles, patting Reg on the cheek as she selects a door and walks through to the room beyond. Deep red velvet fabric greets them, forming a tent effective above. Spreading out from the central glinting chandelier to the walls where it descends in soft rivulets to the floor, aware of yet more mirrors, these of varying styles and sizes that all but cover the draped walls which, as the three pass, appear to maneuver themselves, allowing Francine to see her companions at all times and from all angles. To Trad's horror, this also allows him to see her at all times and from all angles. I must say, this century is probably the most relaxed for us herbalists and healers, she replies to Reg. Is that what you call yourself now? Trad mutters from behind her, taking in the large but intimate room. The choice of furniture, clearly from their own collection, which, although considered spectacular by some, outstanding by others, is deemed to be just, just weird by Trad. The tabletops, dressers, and glass cabinets display fine jewels encrusted into figurines on bangles, necklaces, and tiaras, and he is quite certain a substantial collection of Fabridge eggs, not in itself surprising. The sisters did have exquisite taste, but still, he just couldn't help wondering exactly how the bewitchers had obtained such treasures. Then again, judging by the stupid grin on his brother's face, he supposed he didn't really have to think too hard. The subdued lighting from the varied lamps and candles bouncing off the jewels and mirrors, keeping the fabric hung room from being oppressive, lush green palms offering welcome relief from the deep red. Also, have the effect of minimizing the impact of Francine's multiple reflections on Trad. We have always been herbalists and healers, Trad, she replies to his snipe. Unfortunately, history has not been kind to us, being so often written by the ones with most power, which, as we know, are not always the ones that deserve it, she smiles sweetly in Trad's direction, picking up a tall slender jar from an array of samples neatly arranged on a table. Trad views the sludge green contents, all natural ingredients, he reads, natural meaning dead bodies, no doubt. He holds up the jar of pale green cream and suggests. Eye of Newt, perhaps? Taking the jar from him, Francine places it carefully into a neat little box. The elegant lettering informing of its contents. Still listening to old wives' tale, Trad, darling? She smiles, bringing his attention to the cruelty-free logo on the side. You know as well as I 
we bewitchers are true to our honest beliefs. We have never harmed a living thing in pursuit of our cause. And yet, he responds, there are so many stories that would suggest otherwise. Much like the misconceptions surrounding some of your exploits, Trad dear, she smiles. We all get bad press at times, and occasionally it works in our favor. For it to go unchanged or unchallenged, wouldn't you agree? Whatever, Trad grouches, walking away, throwing a despairing look as he passes Reg, who, unaware of anything other than Francine, continues to grin and gaze. Chamomile face scrub, she says brightly, returning her samples, our best seller, fantastic results, our treatment rooms, she informs Trad, have a three month waiting list. Amazing, Reg breathes dreamily. And he is gone. <coughs> Reg, Trad hisses at his brother. Will you? And of course, there is Ilona Beth's fashion line. Francine interrupts, clapping her hands loudly, turning as a section of fabric wall parts revealing a group of mannequins, each wearing a beautifully designed outfit highly reminiscent of the Octonumi uniform. Hardly groundbreaking, Trad murmurs, glancing at his own uniform and pointing out the resemblance. Oh, but it is over here in Fabris, darling. Quite the rage, she smiles. But, of course, you not being a fan of Fethris, I suppose, are a little out of touch. <laughs> Very, as I understand it. Before Trad can respond, his brother sighs. Wow, that's amazing. His eyes have not left Francine. Solid gone, says the narrator. Yeah, well, Trad says, glancing at his brother. The reason we, music erupts around them, stopping further conversation, and the mannequins spring to life, strutting their best catwalk strides towards them. The high-end fashion parades itself around the room, finding themselves caught up in an impromptu fashion show. The boys become encircled by sashaying apparel. The stage empties, more mannequins appear, and more and more fashion piles into the room as the furniture maneuvers itself out of the way. And of course, Francine calls above the music. There is Cetrice's collection. Yet more mannequins appear, the emphasis now on bags, shoes, and jewelry. Amazing, Reg sighs, his eyes still glued on Francine. Get a hold of yourself, man, says the narrator. Fran, Trad starts, cut off by the appearance of Ilona Beth, Murphy, Panamsi, and Cetrice, Carindel, Polymphy. 
Francine's sisters, who, having appeared on the stage, are looking oddly identical. Darlings! Speaking as one, their movements in sync. Not leaving each other's sides, the sisters smile and wave from the far side of the merriment. With the room in full-on party mode, mannequins dancing a jazzed-up waltz flash past Trad, intermediately blocking his view of the sisters, the laughters and music increasing as Trad attempts to get Reg's attention. Spinning past Reg, now with a dance partner, continues to twirl a brunette mannequin, oblivious to anything else in the room. Well, this is embarrassing. Pushing through the dancing clothes, Trad grabs Reg and shouts in his ear, Something's wrong! You are not dancing! Reg shouts cheerfully. That's what's wrong! Isn't it amazing? He grins, whirling his mannequin. Good grief. This, Trad shouts, gesturing around. This is a scariotent tactic. You just don't know how to relax, Reg replies, as he is about to be whisked away. Grabbing his collar, Trad hauls him reluctantly away from his dancing partner, still jiggling, smiling, and clapping. Reg bobs in time to the beat while watching the room. Cetrice is beautiful, Trad shouts into Reg's ear. I'd call that progress, Reg smiles, still enjoying the spectacle. No, you don't understand. Releasing Reg, Trad makes his way toward the sisters, who clearly not wanting to be close, continue to skirt the room. Right. If that's how it's going to be, he mutters, clicking his fingers. In a split second, he is in front of Citrice, reaching for her arm. His hand passes straight through her. Instantly, all movement comes to a juttering halt. The mannequins resume their fixed positions. The music winds down, with the exemption of Reg. Lost in his own world of entertainment, the room is still, and Citrice evaporates. What the hell? Trad growls. I told you it wouldn't work, Ilona Beth utters, collapsing into a chair, her flowing robes melting into a neat black trouser suit and shirt the subtle green accents catching the light. Ritually, a carbon copy of her sister, with the exception of said green and rose aroma, Elonabeth slouches into the chair, her jacket bunching up, letting her legs spread out before her, the similarities between the two sisters only extending to looks and not decorum. Francine sighs, at her sister's unkempt posture, and with rather more dignity perches neatly on the arm of a neighboring chair, her attire mirroring that of her sister's, the purple flecks transferring themselves into the thin pine strip of her suit fabric. Can someone please explain? Trad stands over the two and indicates Reg, who is still jigging around the room. And can you please drop the bewitching stuff? Waving her hand absently, 
In Reg's direction, Francine sighs. Citrice has gone. The soothing tones are now replaced by a less intoxicating lit. What I miss? Reg grins stupidly, coming to a slightly dazed halt. Gone? Trad repeats, ignoring his brother and addressing the sisters. They each nod. How gone? Disappeared gone? Or gone shopping gone? In a huff gone. Where? We don't know. You don't know? Trad exclaims. What the hell happened? Lowering her head, Francine fiddles with one of her many rings, making it quite clear that she will not be answering. Well, Ilona Beth begins. It's silly, really. We were having a little discussion that got out of hand, and she just got all uppity. She pauses, looking at the boys. You know how she does. Their blank expressions indicating that they do not. Well, she continues, without a word, she just left. The blank expressions are now accompanied by a silent and, and hasn't spoken to us since. Alona Beth finishes, how long? Trad asks, oh, not that long, she shrugs, a few days. A week, maybe two. What? Reg, who is now completely up to speed with events, interrupts. Why didn't you notify the Alliance? He directs this question to Francine, who is still determinedly studying her rings. Well, Alana Beth replies, glancing hesitantly at the unresponsive Francine. We thought she would sulk for a while and then come back. It's not like she hasn't done this before. With no contact? Chad asks. Well, no, Alona Beth admits. It's not as if we haven't tried to contact her, but... But? Chad interjects. Francine stands and busses herself with stacking boxes. Well, it's the diffusion, Ilona Beth states, as if they should know what she is talking about. You know, part of the terms and conditions. Francine sighs deeply, sensing the boy's confusion. Look, she says, turning. We all know a bewitcher's limitations, she pauses. We have been known to implement the odd, how shall we say, unrest, disaster, death. Trad, aware now that they are all glaring as, oh, I'm sorry, I thought we were on a roll. Yes, well, most of our indiscretions were a result of, of irrational thought. So, blight and plague were because of an irrational thought, were they? Trad questions. Yes, actually they were. She responds. If you cross a bewitcher, you pay the price. I thought you were incapable of such emotions. Trad probes, glancing at Reg. We all have our weaknesses. She replies flatly, glancing across at the small black cat entering the room. So, she continues, ignoring the cat's unblinking stare, as it positions itself onto a small table across from her. In addition to the already intrusive measures we have placed on us, she shoes away another black cat as it works its way past her leg. And as a condition of the Alliance, we have agreed 
to the diffusion. If any one of us is angered, we are basically on lockdown until we regain rational thought. So this explains Clara's reaction. Trad indicates the shop. You didn't know we were coming. We don't know anything. Alona Beth mumbles. Alona Beth! Francine snaps. Then, forcing a smile, she continues. It's not that we know nothing. We are just on... How shall I put this? We're on a time lag. Time lag? Yes, Francine replies. We're... We're obviously still aware of all things that are happening here. And happening where, when, and how. Just... Not necessarily at the time they happen. Definitely not before, Elona Beth mutters as the wandering cat sits at her feet. No, Francine agrees quietly. Not before. But I thought which... Trad hesitates, correcting himself. Bewitchers knew everything. Not one person knows everything, Francine states. But together, Reg adds, Well, that's quite a different situation, she smiles. Hence, the Sparian didn't. Trad gestures, the now lifeless fashion scene, buying time for us to catch up. Yes, Francine replies. The time lag varies. I was hoping that we would be brought up to speed while you were at the mercy of the scary undent. Trad finishes. She smiles weakly. So this is not a social visit, Alona Beth asks brightly, spontaneously laughing out loud. Trad tries unsuccessfully to cover it up with a cough. When he registers the hurt expression clouding Alona Beth's face. So what happened? Reg asks, how did you upset her? Alona Beth mumbles something and inspects her hands while Francine resumes sorting the jars. Well? Reg pushes. Well, I was being honest. Alona Beth snaps. And? Well... Her bum did, in fact, look big. You told Satrice she looked fat, Trad asks. Not exactly. Then what? That, Alona Beth sighs deeply. A hippo would look better in her dress. She pauses. And prettier. You are not seriously telling me that she left because you called her names, Trad asks. Well, no, Francine interrupts. No? Alona Beth echoes in surprise, turning to look at her sister. She had word from a friend who needed help, Francine replies, avoiding Alona Beth's eye. She went to them. And not because I said she was fat? No. Francine replies, busying herself again. But you let me think it was. 
Well, it, it was hurtful, and... But I've been racked with guilt. You could have told me. It was better that I didn't. Better for whom? What could possibly be so important? Uh, ladies? Reg interrupts. Sorry. Sorry. So, who's friend? He asks. Francine hesitates, unsure of what to say. Look, you clearly have no idea what's been happening, Reg stresses. We need access to the m foam Wenglod. He looks at both women. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that requires the three of you. He pauses. You need Satrice. Not to mention, she's out there on her own, Trad mutters. As he wanders over to a table laden with photographs of the three. But she's not responding, Ilonabeth protests. Because she can't, Trad replies, picking up a photo of the three girls. So much for the camera never lies, he considers, studying the three beautiful women. She cannot? Alonabeth asks. Something's not right, Trad replies. The frame... Trad replaces the frame while continuing to scan the others. Well, clearly, Francine begins. No, he snaps, turning to face her, instantly rethinking the move and sharply diverting her eye, his eyes. No, you don't understand. She's in trouble. Something has happened to her. Ever since we got here, the vibes are all wrong. I put it down to my... He hesitates, glancing at them. Well, anyway, something is not right. She's in trouble. I can feel it here. He touches his chest at the same time, shooting Reg a don't-even-think-about-it look. I'm serious. Trad continues. She is in trouble. He looks to the girls. Who is this friend? Shifting uncomfortably as all three look to her for answers. Francine sighs deeply, lowering herself gracefully into a chair. Obadius, she says quietly. She's gone to Obadius. Him? Alonabeth exclaims, quickly stepping in front of Alonabeth. As she advances on her sister, Reg maneuvers her back to her seat. How could she? Tears well in Alonabeth's eyes as she questions her sister. Alonabeth, I... Francine trails off as Alonabeth dissolves into sobs. Sorry, am I missing something? Trad asks, bewildered by the event unfolding before them. Obadias, Francine, says flatly. Bullivant, Bullivant, Bullivant. Trad repeats, not quite sure. He is hearing correctly. Yes, I know, she adds, holding up her hand to stop further interruption. But Cetris is very close to Obadias. Very close. They always have been, even before, she trails off. So was I, sister, Alonabeth sobs. So was I. I'm afraid that you must excuse Alonabeth. She and Oliviant were betrothed before before my snake of a sister stole him from me. Alona Beth, Francine snaps at her. Now is not the time. Addressing the boys, she continues. When it comes to Obadius, Cetris cannot help herself. 
She is bewitched, not the bewitcher. I thought you were immune to influence of any kind, Trad queries, looking again at Reg. When it comes to the counsel of others, Francine smiles, we cannot be swayed. For our own, however, she shrugs, it happens to the best of us. So Trad asks, Cetris knows how to get to Heathernet, Atij. You don't go to Heathernet, Francine informs him. You are invited. By whom? Not by whom. By what? She replies. The Heathernet plays on a weakness, a need, something you want but is either far from your grasp or not part of your destiny. The Heathernet offers up your desires. It's up to you if you pursue them with the help of the Heathernet or not. Obviously, there are consequences when accepting anything from such as the Heathernet. But not you, right? Trad snipes. You don't have to be invited, do you? You know where it is. Of course, she replies. We all do, Arona Beth adds. And you didn't think to tell us that? Why would we? Alona Beth asks. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps when Bolivia took the kids to the Heathernet, or perhaps when Bolivia killed them, or perhaps when Bolivia went hiding at the Heathernet. Trad. Reg tries to stop his brother. No, don't trad me. He snaps. They knew how to get to him and didn't think that perhaps, just perhaps, we would like to know. He looks at them. Whose side are you on, exactly? But Trad. We are exactly on no one's side, Francine huffs, standing to confront him. As you put it, my dear, we are but arbitrators. Don't give me that sh- Trad! Red shouts, then calmer. It doesn't matter now, does it? They're alive. What? Alonabeth reacts immediately. They appear to be alive, Reg replies. The Beluvian children. So you know, Alonabeth says, glancing at Francine. Yes, we... What? Reg hesitates. You knew? Trad asks, not quite ready to hear the answer. Of course we knew. Francine replies, returning to the packing of jars. And again, you didn't tell us. Trad shouts. Again, it is not our purpose. Families were torn apart. Devastated. Trad advances on her. What kind of heartless traitors? By the very slightest movement of her forefinger, Trad is suddenly lifted up and tossed across the room where he hangs suspended in midair. It is one thing to doubt our true self, Francine addresses Trad in a measured tone turning to face him. It is another to doubt our integrity, young Tradian. There is more at stake here than you know, she takes a breath. But right now, she pauses and unceremoniously releases Trad, landing him in a heap alongside Alonabeth's cat, who unfazed halts the licking of her paw, long enough to issue a contemptuous glare at him before continuing her grooming. What is more important here? 
she continues, ignoring Trad's scowling displeasure, is how you found out. Nate, Reg starts to explain. We haven't got time for this, Trad cuts in, stepping forward and reluctantly taking Elonabeth's and Francine's hands, instinctively a whirlwind of information circles the two women, filling their minds with a carousel of images and information they have missed. After a moment, they step back and the connection is broken. It would seem, Alona Beth hesitates, that our separation has been by design to stop us from seeing. Francine mutters. So, not infallible, Chad comments, throwing another told-you-so glance at Reg. And it would seem that you and your operatives are being kept apart as well, Francine continues. One would assume so that you cannot pick up on the children's whereabouts. And why we have to find Citrice. Trad clarifies. Are you sure she is with Abadeus? Reg asks, without a doubt. So how do we find her? And that, my dear friends, is where we're going to end it for today. Tune in next time to see... If they find Satrice and the children and the other operatives. And until then, this is Ruby signing off.